This excerpt was taken from a full bloom interview with producer engineer Alex Perielis. Anthrax, spreading the disease, released on this day in history. To listen to the entire interview, click the link in the description. So how does this whole association with Johnny Z come about? Yeah, so um, Metallica did their first record uh, in Rochester, New York, at a studio called Music America, with uh, a producer named Paul Curcio that came from the disco industry, is my understanding. I don't I don't know a lot about his history. I think that I just read recently that he had passed away. I think he just passed away recently. He wasn't that old. Maybe a little older than me, but um, not... Not that old, and uh, and he somehow found his way to Rochester, New York, and opened a studio there. They did their first record there, and the Anthrax was the next band that was slated to go into that studio. Uh, and he was in the middle of changing gear, so Anthrax was supposed to be there. Supposedly, the story goes that they loaded up and went there, and um, and there was no gear, so they were waiting around for a couple of days, and then started looking for studios. Uh, in upstate New York because they were up up here. And uh, Carl Kennedy, who is uh, the drummer in the Rod, was friends uh, with Paul Curcio's engineer. His name was Chris Bubosh. And uh, somehow one thing led to another, and uh, Charlie and Scott came to Pyramid. They they said, we want to hear something that you've done that has guitars. And I played them something I'd been working on with a band from Binghamton, New York, that was pretty heavy, kind of a cross between Rush and Merciful Fate. <laughs> wow. What was the, the name of that band? Uh, they were they were called Lord West. And all those people said that they didn't go forward in the, uh, with anything in the sense of um, careers in the industry. They were all talented guys, but uh, they went in multiple directions. In fact, there is a track on uh, an album that came out on Megaforce that was called, I think, Deeper Into the Vault, which was a bunch of B-sides and stuff that was really odd and weird from the Megaforce collection. And there, the song by that band is on that album called, uh, under the name Imperious Rex. <laughs> so just to hear kind of what they were about. So you play yeah, so, you play them, you know, that recording, and um, and so that's how it, your connection with them begins? Yeah, and then, you know, Carl was actually slated to, to produce the, the first uh, Anthrax record. That's kind of how that whole connection came from. And, and I had worked with Carl before. We knew each other from projects prior to that. So Carl's the one actually um, produced the first two Anthrax records that were done at Pyramid. Uh, you mentioned Spreading the Disease. Uh, he's, you know, he produced that record. I engineered it. Carl had a long history as a producer. And I did learn a bunch from him as well. And he was a very close friend and still is. You know, we, he just he lives in Pennsylvania now, but he lives in Cortland, New York, which is, you know, 35 minutes from up the So... We were friends, worked on a bunch of projects. And, you know, he did a bunch of projects on his own, too. He's a very good producer and, and still active musician in a band called The Rods. Armed and Dangerous, were those songs, were all the songs on Spreading the Disease uh, re-recorded, or were some of those just remixed? No, those, 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 those see, Johnny was really smart, right? You gotta give Johnny, John Z and Marsha Zazula, you gotta give them a thumbs up for being really innovators. Because they were, you know, they created that, that label from nothing and turned it into, you know, a serious entity that, you know, had a lot to do with the with the genre. So I, I do believe that without people like Saley and, and Brian at Metal Blade and believers at Megaforce and people that believe, you know, at uh, Music for Nations and Combat Records and all those early adopters of believing in the style, without those people, then I don't think that the industry would have ever seen the bands that happened. And without those people that were believers, the major labels weren't going to look at that stuff and think it was worth anything. Um, but there was a cohort of really, um, they are the special people that without their intestinal fortitude and their commitment to a style of music and the bands that they nurtured, we would never have the Metallicas and the Anthraxes and the, and the Slayers and on and on and on. In fact, you know, I could sit here for 10 minutes and list every cool band that you know about sure. that came out of that genre because of those people. That's, uh, that's pretty important stuff. And so John and Marsha's notion was to use it like a, like a promotional CD or like drop it a single, but that was in the era where nobody dropped a single. The EP was the thing, so those four songs were dropped early to try to stimulate some um, some interest in the band. We were in the midst of doing Spreading the Disease, but the notion was to finish those songs for the EP 
uh, to, to stimulate some interest, and that's kind of what he did. And that was a really smart move. You just remixed them, some of those songs? You remixed them, uh, possibly, you know, or what was on the record was an alternate mix of a mix that was done for the EP. But it was like, get the EP done, and then continue on making the record, basically. That was it. That's what, what happened. Uh-huh. And so that's also... All from the same session. Like, the session went on. We just we stopped tracking, mixed those tunes, and then and then went forward. You know? Oh, I got you. It wasn't like a you know pack it up and go home and then come back. It was like that was done in the midst of the session, basically. That's the uh, introduction to Joey Belladonna. How was it working with him? Great. In, in fact, last year uh, they all played um, you know big outdoor amphitheater when they were on tour with Slayer and, and company and Testament. I went to the show. It was great. And I hadn't seen all those folks in in one place since uh, maybe. I spent a while, so I, I drove over there. We hung out. It was great, and uh, I think it was actually the day of that concert, uh, that outdoor show, was the day that practice was released um, thirty years ago. <laughs> so it's pretty wild. Was there a favorite vocal chain for Joey? Not necessarily favorite. I mean, you know, typically I always sang on either an eighty-seven or a sixty-seven. You know, that was always the thing. Neumann's typically, you know, thinking about Mike Pramp, Mike Preamplifiers. We didn't have a whole lot of different pre's at Pyramid at that point. We had a couple of things. Um, but uh, mostly when we were doing stuff in the other studios, that's when we started looking at other options. But typically uh, an 87, an original 87, not an 87 AI, but an 87 for Joey, or U67. Was always sort of a go-to for him. And you use the Mike Pre's from the board, or you just you, you don't remember which one you used? Let's see. For Joey at Pyramid, I would imagine if I remember right, it was either going to be one of the uh, older knees that we had at, maybe around at that time, or it would have been one of the Pre's and the Harrison, which were really really good Mike Pre's. Yeah. And David Harrison was a smart guy. Uh, had defected from MCI to start his own company. That's the lineage of, of Harrison. And then what about guitar tone? What's your typical go-to, uh, say, back then to record? Uh, back then, uh, 57s and MD-421s, basically. <laughs> Always the same. Always the same approach to this day. You know, it's sort of what I still go for, um, for, for at least that type of guitar tone. And it's really about guitar player, <laughs> because I know I've, I've read some other stuff that you printed on your site about what other people say about guitars and, and guitar tone and whatnot. I mean, well, obviously there's some tricks to the trade, but the reality is that it's all about the person's hands and how they play because you could hand, you know, Scott's guitar to five people and it won't sound like Scott or Eric Peterson or Alex Coleman, same thing, you know, I mean, James Hatfield. I mean, I never got to work with James personally, but I just know from watching the videos and hearing him play it and know how he plays that, any of those guitarists, it's about them. It's about how they play. It's about how they mute, what gauge strings they're playing. How do they personally react with the amplifier? There's a symbiotic thing that happens with a guitarist between their hand, their instrument, and, and their gear. And that's a, that's a very kind of zen personal thing. It's not about gear at that point. <laughs> because you could put a bad microphone up in front of somebody who's a good player and you're still going to get a great performance, right? So Yeah, especially with Anthrax. I mean, they always, even the drums always, uh, and the bass. I mean, honestly, they all, they had their own unique sound. Yeah, well, they're a unique band. Just like, you know, just like every, every band has a unique thing. And that's what makes bands great is that there's multiple personalities that actually make a whole. And that's what you don't get these days with a bunch of people that haven't played together for a long time. You know, bands like Anthrax that are playing together with a like-minded approach from the time they were really young, the time they were teenagers, they played together. Obviously, Joey was the new addition for that. And the other thing is, if you think about that Anthrax um, scenario that you were asking about, going from the first version with Neil in the band and from Fistful of Metal and then going to a totally different style singer like Joey, who was could sing anything. The, the EP was a brilliant way to launch a look at the new band. That's why I give kudos to John and Marsha about that's just brilliant marketing, right? You're gonna you had some success with a band. Um, the lead singer is a very important part of any project, and now you're bringing somebody in totally new to a band that already made some noise and uh, had had a following, and now you're gonna change the lead singer. That's that's kind of dangerous. <laughs> so. Not to make a pun here, <laughs> but uh, and for them to actually release that EP was a way to sort of show the world that there was this new person in the band. So that was brilliant. 
Yeah. Didn't uh, Dan and Joey come in at the same time? I'm sorry, Dan left. At Dan, the... Dan left the band as well. So, you know, that was that, that's where you, you know, have a new bass player. Um, and, and, uh, but that's the exact that's, like, same know, time, that's... correct? Frank comes in at the same yeah. time as Joey? Yep. What was the reason Brilliant. for parting with Dan? Uh, you know, Dan was just going a different direction. You know? Okay. He was definitely, he, he was more into the more hardcore thing. And the band was definitely moving a slightly different direction. I wouldn't say it was a whole hog different. Anything stand out from recording Madhouse or Medusa? Um, I don't you know anything stand out. I mean, you know, they were just they were they they were at the beginning of like finding themselves as a band. So a little bit of a change from the first record, but not totally off the didn't go totally like off the rails by any means. I mean, those guys are just good musicians, right? At being that young, they they were visionaries. Just like Metallica was a vision, you know, they were visionaries. And uh, and every other band from that year that actually got some traction, they they had a thing. I don't think any of those bands really sounded like each other by any means. They all had a thing. So that's what separated them from a hundred thousand other bands out there that were that were just copying something. Uh, sure. Those guys were not copying anybody. They were really original. Is there any song on that album that has a kind of a memory that stands out? Everything on that record was strong. I mean, they worked really hard. The one thing about those bands, and I'll say this, that they were, they were no bullshit. They worked their asses off. You know, it wasn't like people were sitting around drinking beer, falling over. I mean, they, they were very serious about what they did. And that was the cool part of working with those guys. Standout song from the record. I mean, funny stuff like you know the beginning of the beginning of madhouse is pretty funny with that whole little sequence at the beginning with you know with their good friend tom brown laughing like a like a hyena and uh it was actually the studio manager of the of, of pyramid who did the voice of it's time for your medication that was all kind of funny so that's kind of all comical every time i still hear that i laugh because remember putting that little bit together with a, with a hoot you know we laughed so hard people were peeing their pants <laughs> 